everybody. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank Admirals Hill Marina and Common Co for allowing us to use their space. My name is Veronica Eady. I'm Vice President and Director of Conservation Law Foundation's Massachusetts Advocacy Center. Um, just to give you a little of logistics, um, we're going to be hearing from a number of speakers, um, environmental leaders, community leaders, that'll be followed by a Q&A. First here, and then with people on the phone. So um, Conservation Law Foundation, as you may know, is a leading environmental advocacy organization here in New England, where we've taken on some of the, the biggest battles, the biggest environmental challenges of New England. One of our defining battles was cleaning up Boston Harbor, which uh, at the time was known as one of the dirtiest harbors in the country. We won that battle, and now today, as we celebrate our 50 years of fighting for the environment, um, we are taking on the big, the big battle that perhaps is defining us uh, contemporarily um, against one of the biggest oil companies and of course against climate change. Um, this battle is led by CLS President Brad Campbell. Brad is all too familiar with um, fossil fuel foes. Brad spent many years as the Commissioner of New Jersey DEP uh, where he took on um, ExxonMobil at the time, and we are grateful for his leadership here today as we uh, battle for uh, our progeny and our environment and against climate change. So, Brad. Good afternoon and thank you. We're here today to announce what I believe will be the first step in holding one of the most uh, powerful and profitable corporations in the world accountable for deceiving the public and leaving communities right here along the Mystic River at Chelsea Creek at risk. Uh, as many of you know, uh, there have been a series of re revelations uh, led by Inside Climate News, represented here today by, by Jack Cushman, uh, who we're honored to have with us, showing that for years, ExxonMobil scientists uh, and its internal business planners acknowledged and recognized that carbon dioxide emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, were going to lead to catastrophic impacts on our environment and communities. And yet, uh, they told the public exactly the opposite. It's hard to imagine that since literally the Nixon administration, ExxonMobil scientists have, con have confirmed internally and done the scientific work to know that climate change was directly related to man-made emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, that it was going to lead to catastrophic consequences uh, for the environment and for civilization, uh, and that those consequences would not be averted unless carbon dioxide em emissions were limited. Uh, and yet, even as ExxonMobil and its scientists came to that conclusion in the Nixon administration. 
They spent hundreds of millions of dollars up to and through the Obama administration to persuade the public of exactly the opposite, that the link between manned emissions of greenhouse gases uh, and climate change was uncertain, uh, that the science was debatable. And so with this deceit of the public and of communities, uh, Exxon has been able to hold off uh, action by elected officials uh, to address climate change. It's been able to hold off efforts to limit emissions in this country. Uh, but more importantly, or just as importantly, they've left communities at risk, uh, and communities right here along the Mystic River and Chelsea Creek. ExxonMobil knew the facts, it spent hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and funded a vast disinformation campaign to persuade the public uh, that climate change is not real or that the climate science is uncertain. Even as they internally planned their business investments uh, around uh, the inevitability of climate change, looking to previously uh, harsh terrains in Russia for new oil reserves, uh, planning on the Arctic Sea melting, designing billion dollar oil platforms to withstand rising seas and more extreme weather events. They left this community here along the Chelsea Creek and Mystic River at risk. Because even as they designed their high end investments to withstand climate change, they left their low end investments, the ones right in the heart of communities uh, as they were. They did nothing to ensure those facilities would be able to withstand the rising seas, the, the more intense precipitation, the more extreme storm events uh, that are associated with the climate, in, climate change impacts that lie just ahead of us. We've seen in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy, we saw after Hurricane Katrina uh, in Louisiana, that these types of facilities, facilities like the ExxonMobil storage are enormously vulnerable. The tanks can collapse uh, in the face of inundation and just about every storm event when it's modeled uh, with climate impacts factored in puts the ExxonMobil facility in Everett underwater. And it's not just that the tanks would collapse. This is a facility that's been operating on the site for literally a hundred years. Oil, the soils at the site are saturated with oil and hazardous substances. And though that oil, those hazardous substances, in the event, and we would say in the inevitable event, that the facility is inundated, would be spread throughout the communities around us and throughout the Boston Harbor complex, uh, which taxpayers in this state have spent a generation cleaning up so that their, our children and uh, their children can enjoy it. Uh, so this is where climate deceit comes home in terms of impacts to communities that have historically hosted and borne the cost of having these facilities in their midst. When we began our investigation, which really built on the Inside Climate News investigation, uh, we started to look at what and whether this facility could withstand climate impacts. And what we found was the facility was not even operating within the law in day-to-day -day conditions. It didn't take an extraordinary storm for this facility to violate its Clean Water Act permits. Uh, but in fact, even everyday stormwater events were overwhelming their waste treatment system and result resulting in uh, oil and hazardous waste pollution directly into the Chelsea Creek and the Mystic River. And we're not talking about trivial violations of a permit. These are not technical violations. The violations that we found were orders of magnitude, 10 times or more exceedances uh, of their permit limits. And in many cases, those exceedances were very potent percentages. Uh, 
in the midst of a densely populated area. And so today, the Conservation Law Foundation uh, is saying enough is enough. Uh, these communities around this community, around this facility, uh, are at risk. ExxonMobil has the resources, has the means to stop that risk and protect the communities, but has elected, despite its great resources, not to do so. And not only has failed to act, but year in and year out, has reported to the regulators, especially the US EPA, that they're doing everything they can to avoid release of hazardous substances or oil. These, this is, these are sworn statements to federal agencies, not only deceiving the public in newspaper ads and public information campaigns, but actually lying to the cop on the beat in sworn statements. Uh, it is not something one takes on lightly, challenging the most profitable and most powerful corporation in the world, uh, but there are a few factors uh, that make me enormously confident uh, that CLF will prevail in this fight as it has in other fights. One is that we have an extraordinary team of advocates uh, led in this case uh, by Chris Killian and Zach Griffin who are here today, uh, joined by Katie McKean, uh, who've been working on this case for months. And the second reason is because uh, we are not here uh, just as a bunch of lawyers bringing a lawsuit. We are here in partnership with community organizations that are on the front lines of addressing these and other risks. Uh, and you'll hear from those community leaders in a moment. But I want to say one further thing that puts this action in context. Here along the Chelsea Creek and along the Mystic River, uh, we have a wonderful resource uh, for the Boston area. It could be a beautiful source of recreation, of rebounding uh, living resources, fisheries, uh, but instead, unlike the Charles River, it's been largely neglected uh, over the decades. You go along the Charles River, you see wonderful recreation facilities. It has been the darling of regulators. It has been the subject of the attention of numerous governors and senior officials. The Mystic has enjoyed no such benefits. While the Charles has a pollution budget, it has uh, the essentially analysis done to determine how to uh, eliminate the major pollution sources, eliminate the impairments to the river. The Mystic River and the Chelsea Creek have never had that benefit. We spoke to EP the US EPA and they said the resources, even to do the data collection to start that effort, are not going to be available in either this budget cycle or any foreseeable budget cycle. Uh, it's time for that to change. It's time for this state and the federal government to protect all of its rivers, to protect all of its citizens equally from climate deceit and from the pollution uh, that threatens the heart of their communities. And I'm delighted to be joined uh, by our community partners who are on the front lines, who have, have long been hosting the ExxonMobil facility, whose neighbors and families are at risk uh, because of ExxonMobil's climate deceit. So I will turn the program over to our partners. Next, I'm really uh, delighted to have with me today, have with us today, Roseanne Bon Giovanni, who's a, an old friend and long-standing environmental justice activist. Roseanne is with Chelsea Green Space, and she's a resident of Chelsea, and so you'll hear from Roseanne next, and she'll introduce the community residents and other activists um, in the area. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Brad. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, 
As Veronica said, I'm an environmental justice activist and advocate. I've been working for 20 years um, for the benefit of our community and for the improvement of the community in which I live in. One thing that we, we haven't said is that uh, I'm a mother of two small children and there are two lessons that I tell my children all the time. One, learn from your mistakes. Two, never, ever, ever lie. I realized that I have two small children. I didn't realize that the third was Exxon Mobil that continues, continues to not listen to those lessons and doesn't get that message. It's a beautiful, sunny, warm day here today, but I want to take you back more than 10 years ago. In January of 2006, I was training for the Boston Marathon, and as a Chelsea resident, I had gotten up early that morning, ran a few miles, came my, my way down to Mary O'Malley Park, which this area doesn't always have the best air quality. Uh, Chelsea is severely impacted. Chelsea, East Boston, and Everett are severely impacted by environmental injustices and public health threats. Uh, poor air quality is something that we face on a daily basis, but some days are worse than others. And on this January morning, at about 6.30 in the morning, I came through the park having a good run when I all of a sudden said, oh my God, what is that awful smell of petroleum product? It was so nauseating that I put my hand over my mouth and then put my shirt, pulled my sleeve down and put it over my mouth and said, oh my God, I can't breathe. I feel nauseous. This is awful. Came back to my office later that day and said, something must have happened on the Chelsea Creek. Something must have happened on the Mystic River. I need to find out. And I contacted the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard said there was in fact a spill. 10,000 gallons of oil spilled into the Mystic River on that January morning, 2006. Not one company came forward and said, mea culpa, it was our fault. We spilled oil into your river. We're sorry, we'll clean it up. Not one company. The fingers kept being pointed to ExxonMobil and ExxonMobil continually said, it's not our oil, it's not our oil. We didn't do it, it wasn't our spill. Well, ExxonMobil clearly didn't believe in the concepts that the Coast Guard put forward. They now have these techniques where they essentially fingerprint oil, and they took that oil samples, and they fingerprinted it, and the fingers led back to not only but ExxonMobil, who still continue to say it wasn't our oil, it wasn't our spill. Three years later, the, attor the U.S. Attorney filed suit against ExxonMobil, which resulted in a $5.6 million settlement of fines. ExxonMobil paid $5.6 million for spilling 10,000 gallons of oil into our river. They never said they were sorry. They never said that they would fix the damage that had happened. They never said, we won't do it again. But we thought that they would have learned their lesson and they would have stopped lying then and there. Here we are more than 10 years later with more deceit, more lies, more violations of federal regulations, more violations of our own personal health and well-being in our, our environment. We are infuriated that ExxonMobil has continued to lie, has continued to take advantage of our vulnerable communities, and has continued to treat our environment like we're nothing, we're trash, it's a dumping ground. Just continue to spit on our face. We are so pleased to be here today with the Conservation Law Foundation, the Mystic River Watershed Association, and so many other supporters who are here today because we need to show ExxonMobil that they need to stop lying and they need to learn their lessons and they're going to pay for it. And they're gonna pay, pay, pay until our communities have pristine waters where we can swim, where we can boat, where we can fish, where we can run on any given day and not have to worry about our health and our well-being. Thank you all so much for being here today. And I want to thank the folks at Conservation Law Foundation for putting this action forward. Uh, what I'm, I'm holding in my hand is um, a notice I, I forgot to mention. So uh, some residents in Chelsea got this notice several months ago, maybe, maybe in January or February, and they said, Rosie, we got this notice in the mail that says a neighbor's guide to ExxonMobil. Why do you think Exxon's doing this? When they send out, when oil companies send out these glossy pamphlets, it means they're up to no good. We're <laughs> concerned. And this, if you read it, shows what a good neighbor ExxonMobil is. Well, clearly, ExxonMobil isn't that good of a neighbor. Now, they should take this brochure and put it where their oil is spilling and start paying attention to environmental justice communities because they may be trying to take advantage of us, but we will not be taken advantage of. So thank you all so much for being here today.
option of introducing some of our activists who are frontline warriors for environmental justice and improvements in our community. The first person I would like to introduce is Alejandrina Rodriguez. She's an activist, a mother, a resident here in Chelsea who has been a leader of environmental justice efforts in our community. Alejandrina. Mi nombre es Alejandrina Rodríguez, soy residente de Chelsea y soy miembro y bien, bien involucrada en justicia ambiental de Chelsea Green Space. My name is Alejandrina Rodríguez, I am a resident of Chelsea and I am extremely involved with environmental justice and Green Space Coalition. He luchado fuertemente para que la ciudad de Chelsea sea una comunidad más saludable y más limpia. I work very hard with other activists in the community for our community to be clean and just. Garantizando que los residentes tengan el mismo acceso a la eficiencia energética, a servicio ofrecido a través de las empresas públicas. I work really hard with other community members so everyone in the community have environmental uh, justice and also have um, uh, energy efficiency that is offered by utility companies. Uh, a través de este trabajo he aprendido que si los residentes no están, no son proactivos, entonces las industrias y las empresas uh, de servicio público no respaldarán nuestra comunidad. Through the work that I've done with other community members, I've learned firsthand that residents need to be proactive in order to buy uh, these companies, utility companies and utilities. So, Chelsea, uh, Everett, East Boston, son uh, comunidades uh, de justicia ambiental. The surrounding cities like Everett, Chelsea, Revere, and East Boston are environmental justice communities. Nosotros estamos luchando y hemos luchado bien fuerte para mantener una comunidad saludable, sana y limpia de descontaminación. We work very hard all these communities together to have a healthy, safe environment and communities. So, nosotros tenemos los residentes de, de estas comunidades tenemos que ponernos de pie y luchar porque no es posible que compañías e industrias como ExxonMobil venga a contaminar nuestros ríos. Um, if we, uh, all community members in these cities should stand up and fight because we cannot allow uh, an industry like ExxonMobil to do this to our uh, rivers and our areas and our residents, communities. So, tenemos que unirnos todos y luchar porque si vemos y observamos y pasamos estadísticas de, de que eh, es tan grande la escasez de agua que hay en otros países, en otros estados, y nosotros somos privilegiados de tener esta rica agua, ¿por qué permitir que una compañía o una industria como Exxon Morro venga a destruir y a quitarnos este tesoro como es nuestra agua? So, um, we um, need to stand together, I say it again, and we need to fight industries like ExxonMobil. Other countries lack this amazing and beautiful resources that we have, which is all this waterfront. And why a company like ExxonMobil um, keeps damaging our, our waterfront um, that we cannot um, enjoy. So, necesitamos luchar por el bienestar de nuestra familia, de nuestra comunidad, por el bienestar de un ambiente saludable, Y si tenemos que luchar contra eh, Exxon Mobil y buscar que se le haga justicia y que lo lleven ante los pies de los tribunales, unámonos, que juntos podemos hacerlo y lo vamos a hacer porque estamos en eso. Muchas gracias. I want to say, to close up, that um, Exxon Mobil needs to um, respect our communities and, our, and, and we deserve to have a health and um, safe um, waterfront. We also need to continue fighting, and if we have to bring ExxonMobil in front of the judge in a court of law, uh, we need to do it and fight for what is right for us in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandrina, for your leadership, your words, and for being here today to stand with us.
Next, I have the great pleasure of introducing Magdalena Ayed. Magdalena is a resident of East Boston. She's a mother and she's an activist. We realized in Chelsea and East Boston that our efforts would be in vain if it was just one community fighting on behalf of the waterfront. So we've unified with our, our folks across the river in East Boston, organized through the neighborhood of affordable housing. Magdalena organizes the residents of East Boston. She's an amazing person and she has become quite the climate change science expert. Please uh, help me in welcoming Magdalena Ayer. Thank you, Rosie. But you're my hero, actually. Um, so our populations in East Boston and Chelsea are both designated as environmental justice communities by Executive Order 552. The EJ order specifically states that all state agencies must devote resources to protect the health, safety, and environment for the most vulnerable residents of the Commonwealth. Chelsea and East Boston have some of the lowest median incomes in the state, yet fewer resources to rely on, are oftentimes socially and linguistically isolated, are disproportionately impacted by a host of environmental hazards, many of which are from fossil fuel-based industries. And I'm gonna give you some statistics here to really put it into perspective. 17% of the East Boston population lives below the poverty line. 55% do not speak English as their first language. East Boston has 15.5 miles of coastline. Eight of them are strictly for Logan Airport. The rest of the 7.5 miles, we did a survey actually, 88% of that 7.5 miles is inaccessible to the public. It's fenced off somehow. We have 1,000 flights and 90,000 passengers daily going through Logan Airport. We have 65,000 MBTA riders every day through the blue and silver line. 87,000 cars utilize our three underwater tunnels per day. You name it. Cars, planes, trucks, large container ships transit through our communities every day, contributing to some of the highest rates of chronic health disorders, such as childhood asthma and coronary heart disease. Our waterways and watersheds, once pristine fishing and swimming holes, are a vital res natural resource, not only to wetlands and marine life, but to the people who live along the waterfront, and we must preserve it. We are at the cusp of a global climate change movement that recognizes not only how the climate change is affecting our urban populations, but how essential our watersheds and oceans are to helping mitigate coastal erosion, sea level rise, and flooding. We have made significant progress to rectifying the extensive pollution of waters, thankfully to the Clean Water Act, but we really don't have time on our hands. We need to not only protect our local communities from any further impacts of environmental hazards, we don't need fossil fuel-based industries to have a healthy economy. The bottom line is that we currently have 2.5 million clean energy jobs generated by the renewable energy industry in the United States. But almost none of those jobs are held by the residents of our community. Let's seize this opportunity today with CLF and this lawsuit to tell Big Oil, clean up your act and protect our communities from further degradation, and let's look to the future to address together the impacts of climate change by preserving our most valuable resource, our oceans and our watersheds, and by building a more vibrant, healthier, more resilient waterfront accessible to all of our residents in East Boston and Chelsea. This will be the best response to the increasing impacts of climate change. Thank you. Magdalena in a fight for climate change and access to the Chelsea Creek and for environmental uh, equality at Chelsea and East Boston, as well as John Walkie, who is here, has been a lifelong resident of, of this area and has been fighting for the past 15 to 20 years for improvements to the Chelsea Creek. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing one of my partners in crime, Catherine Moss. Kate Moss is an amazing, an amazing woman who lives here in Chelsea. She is on the Board of Health, and she single-handedly went just behind us here to the Produce Center, which seemed like an unapproachable place, went in, developed relationships with the Produce Center, and single-handedly brought millions of dollars of federal resources to this area to improve air quality year after year. She helped in improve Chelsea's air quality by reducing 2,000 tons of annual pollutants from the New England Produce Center. She's an amazing woman and a wonderful activist. I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Moss. Hi, everyone. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell you about our community of Chelsea, but when
when Roseanne told a little story about when she was running for the marathon, it just reminded me of my first experience when I first moved to Chelsea. I always thought that I was a really incredible environmentalist. I was, I thought it was really, really good. I recycled and I probably did a couple other things too, but I realized when I moved to Chelsea that I didn't know what environmental justice or environmental injustice meant until I knew, moved to a community like this. And I just wanted to tell you, one of my first weeks I was here, a friend of mine came from Wellesley, and um, we were gonna go out to dinner in East Boston, and um, it was a particularly stinky, stinky evening um, where you could just smell all the oil and gas vapors everywhere. And when he rang the doorbell, I opened the door, and he said, quick, let me in. If I lit a match out here, this whole place will blow. <laughs> you know, that was my first week in Chelsea. And it just I just realized then is that we all have to be more committed um, community members. And that's what really sparked me to maybe um, join everybody else in the community and maybe trying to make a difference. So our urban industrial uh, community of Chelsea is one of the top places that carries the environmental burden for the state. And as you can see when you are here, we are surrounded by storage facilities and the massive transport that supports this economy. The denial that has been perpetuated regarding climate change and the undermining of scientific information to the public that Congress has so readily bought into not only undermines our public health, but has left coastal communities such as Chelsea, East Boston, Everett, unprepared and vulnerable. So we are the frontline community. You are standing in a frontline community. We are the people who pay the price. Low income, communities of color, people who work multiple jobs just to make ends meet, and who are at least likely to get or have time to get involved with the challenges and the changes that need to be made. I just want to tell you how diverse we are here in Chelsea. Our high school has people from 74 countries that speak 64 languages. That's in 1.8 square miles. We in Chelsea, though, have been able to form partnerships and relationships with many businesses and corporations here that realize they have responsibilities to the communities in which they lie and that it is not all right for them to undermine the health of our waterways, our land, our citizens, or to disturb the fragility of the ecosystems where they do their businesses. But I do have to add that from time to time, we do remind them that special interests should never undermine public interest. So let me end with a word of thanks to the Conservation Law Foundation for their vigilance and their help in protecting our natural resources and dedicating work towards safeguarding our coastal communities. that our efforts on behalf of the community aren't just a few of us. There are a few of us represented here today, but our, our efforts are quite big. We have many, many residents who are involved in all of the work in Chelsea, East Boston, and Everett. Some of these residents are here with us today. Judy Dyer is an amazing activist who's on the Conservation Commission and has brought about significant changes for Chelsea. Sada and Mike Sandoval are lifelong residents of Chelsea who are raising their children here and believing in our community. And Dr. Madeline Scammell is in the back. She's also a member of the Board of Health, and she's with the VU School of Public Health, and she has also contributed significantly to the improvement of Chelsea's urban environment, Chelsea, East Boston, and Everett. And I'd like to thank every one of our community members, Sylvia Ramirez, who's a leader, a mother, and a dedicated activist here in the community. Thank you all for being here so much. We have a wonderful star who is going to get a fine introduction from Veronica Eady. As they say, we've saved the best for last. <laughs> better introduction than I could do, but um, thank you, Rosie, thank you, Magdalena, thank you, Alejandrina, thank you, Kate, uh, those were really wonderful words of um, wisdom, really inspiring, and we're really happy that we're partnering with you on this. Um, finally, I would like to introduce a, a dear friend and a tireless environmental activist, Executive Director of the Mystic River Watershed Association, E.K. Calvin. Um, this is really a good day at the Mystic. I think you can see from the passion which our community partners bring to this podium and the intelligence and the awareness that they share 
that we really are privileged to be with these folks who are at the very front line of environmental justice issues and who are making an enormous difference in the Mystic River watershed and on Chelsea Creek. So I'd like to offer a round of applause to all of them for their really great work. Throughout the Mystic River watershed, local community groups are working hard to restore and protect their neighborhood and their local natural environment, the treasures that we share. And this watershed, which extends from Reading all the way out to Winthrop, is really an essential part of the Boston region. And we think that it deserves the attention it's receiving today and the protections that Conservation Law Foundation is making sure we receive. So I have prepared just a few words so that we say it right uh, on behalf of the river and on behalf of all of these community groups who work so hard day in and day out to make a difference. The Mystic is a great river, a river of history. Mystic River communities, as we've heard, are among the most desert, diverse and densely developed in the Commonwealth. And for the past 40 years, many people, many organizations have fought to restore the river to good health. As a result, it is very disappointing to learn that ExxonMobil is violating its own federal stormwater permit and regularly discharging pollution to the Mystic River. It is very disheartening to learn also that ExxonMobil has done nothing at its Everett facility to protect the community from climate change impacts, which it apparently has known are coming for quite some time. In the Mystic right now, one of New England's largest migrations of river herring is underway. Hundreds of thousands of fish will pass up the Mystic River, very close to where we're standing, Mystic's Lake Dam to spawn in Upper Mystic Lake. This wonderful natural phenomena, which has continued without break for the last 10,000 years, needs to be protected. These little fish are making the effort. We put a lot in their way. We should give them a reasonable break. This river is a living system visited by striped bass and harbor seals where wildlife seeks refuge and eagles fly overhead. Communities are working hard to make improvements on the river's banks. In the city of Everett, great effort is being made to reconnect the community to its waterfront at the Wynn Resort site and elsewhere. Just one half mile up the river, the city of Somerville and Federal Realty are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to improve life on the river's banks at Assembly Row. John Priadal at River's Edge is restoring the Malden River and Tufts University has brought its rowing team to practice there. As we clearly see in Chelsea, Everett and East Boston, local community activists are finding ways to bring people to the river and to Chelsea Creek, inspire young students to learn more about the local environment and to provide outdoor recreation opportunities for their communities. In summary, I will just say it is tremendously unfair that one of the largest corporations in the world is putting all of this work in jeopardy. It is time for ExxonMobil to step up to address the ongoing harm it is causing our river and our communities. And we are very grateful the Conservation Law Foundation is holding ExxonMobil accountable for its actions, and we appreciate CLF's promise to help protect and restore the natural environment of the Mystic River of Chelsea Creek. Thank you very much.
that question. The question uh, is to asking me to enlarge on the violations that Exxon's committed, Exxon has committed of their Clean Water Act permit. Um, those are violations uh, looking backward that include releases of hazardous substances in, in one three-year period uh, that we looked at ending in the first quarter of uh, 2016. Uh, the facility was in compliance with its Clean Water Act permit uh, only two of the 12 calendar quarters over that three-year period, and that's based on uh, the self-reported violations that are filed in uh, the US EPA's ECHO database of compliance. But at the same time that they were failing on a day-to-day -day basis to meet their, uh, their Clean Water Act permit, they were also on a regular basis uh, certifying uh, to EPA under their Clean Water Act permit uh, that in terms of stormwater management, they were taking every reasonable measure they could to avoid a release of oil or hazardous substances. Given what they had known about climate change for some time, uh, given the climate uh, impacts that have been well modeled, well understood uh, for the Mystic River and the Chelsea Creek, uh, those statements, which by regulation have to be sworn statements, uh, were essentially false statements. Uh, and so that's a second series of violations uh, that are alleged in this and that link up uh, the climate deceit uh, that ExxonMobil has undertaken at a global level to very real harms in the community. And this, there is another cause of action in the complaint. Uh, federal law allows you to go to court when a facility presents what is called an imminent or may present an imminent substantial endangerment to human health or the environment. And this uh, is a textbook case of an imminent and substantial endangerment because we know uh, it doesn't even take the next storm for there to be an unlawful discharge at this facility. But in the, in the event of such a storm, uh, the impacts to the community, uh, to the river, would be devastating. Uh, and so those are the, those are the essential violations in the complaint. Uh, just to follow on, yeah. I, I think 